Oh. Door's locked. The rain has finally stopped, so this afternoon I'm gonna try and get a shed built down there. Kids' bikes, bins, all that sort of stuff that we need to get tidied up. We'll have a clear up, and then I'm gonna show you the legacy that is our first ever project on the restoration couple. Right, yesterday Joe and I did some sorting in the barn and we managed to load up nearly all of the shed onto this trailer. So the first thing we need to do is to get the floor in place, do a little quick fix on that and then we can get building. Now what's the history behind this shed? This was the first thing I built when, when we bought our first house. And I soon realized after buying our first house that you don't get much for your money if you buy something that's ready made. And it doesn't take an expert to realize what you're getting for your money. You only need to look at some sort of flat pack shed in a DIY merchant, for example, and you'll realize for the same, if not more money, you're not really getting anything better. Actually, you're getting something that's far poorer quality. For example, a typical shed that you buy won't have a timber floor. It'll have an OSB floor and probably only 12 mil OSB at that. Underneath, I've just only used 50 mil by 50 mil timber here. I built this 15 years ago and it's just normal off the shelf treated timber and it's sat out in the garden and I've never ever done anything to it. As long as you've got a bit of airflow below, it's fine. These I imagine were just treated gravel board. So they're 18 mil thick treated. Apart from one that got lost in transit, it's all fine. You can see we had chickens in here at some point, but apart from that, again, it's a nice solid floor. Now there's gonna be more to this video than just me assembling a shed. It's more about what you can learn by doing a small simple build like this and where it can lead to. I contemplated putting it up on some sacrificial timbers but it's not gonna be here for that long. There's not a huge amount of rain that kind of comes across here. If it was further down the yard maybe. But right, so the only little repair is to get a board in there. Unfortunately, I think all of these cedar boards are gonna to be too thick. Nope, it's about right. Is it going to be the right length? Ooh. No. Now first up, if you're a beginner in the DIY world, what are your main barriers to doing something? Well, it's knowledge and resources. Knowledge is a pretty easy one to overcome to a certain level because, you know, the World Wide Web is out there to help you some of the time. And resources, you don't need much to make something that's pretty substantial. So this shed, arguably you could build the whole thing with a drill or an impact driver and a hand saw, if not a circular saw. So for less than 150 pounds, you'd be in uh, with a pack of screws. There's not much more to it. And look, there are always better ways to do things. For example, this floor, I've just screwed in with normal bog standard wood screws. They've corroded a little bit over the years. This board I've just put on is cedar. You know, the textbook would say needs to be stainless steel fixings. And yes, if I was starting this again, I'd probably just nail the whole thing with stainless steel nails and then use screws to put it all together. But in reality, it's a low risk thing. You know, it's a shed. You don't really want to overthink it. Plan something out, sketch something down and give it a go. Because let's face it, you're not going to learn unless you make some mistakes. So I learned plenty on this 
and I'll show you some of them in a minute. Now I was saying you can learn lots on a simple thing like a shed and there are lots of things to learn. Essentially you're building a stud wall, you're fitting cladding, all these things kind of relate to a shed, a summer house, a garage conversion, a garage, a outbuilding or even an extension. So they're all relatable and simple things like basic principles of hardware. Screws, they snap. They're handy if you want to put something together, take it apart. Nails are stronger. Obviously, you've either got a hand nail or you've got to get a nail gun. But just bear in mind, they're not the strongest thing, or a regular screw at least. They can snap and just shear like that. Or like that. Another little simple thing as far as if you're building something, whether it's a log store or a shelf or a rack or something like that, you might decide, oh, you're going to build your uprights first and then if imagine this was your frame that's going to support your load, your shelf, you don't want to be doing this really because all that's supporting, all the weight that you've got on this shelf is one or two screws at the end of here. So if you loaded this up, if this was a log store, for example, you're relying on just two little fixings there. It'd be far stronger if, I'm flipping it upside down just to show you, but if when you built it, you, put your upright and you sat your horizontal on top because then you're relying on just the physics of the fact that all of this is bearing on here. It's no different from if you were building a timber frame building, a huge big frame with two stories. It's all about kind of where things are bearing down and not relying on just little fixings. Never gonna get this shed built today if I keep waffling on. Right, I'll leave that on loose for now, but here's the next little lesson that you might think about when you're building a shed that's gonna help you in the future. At the moment, this is basically our stud wall that we've got sat on the edge of this frame, which is our floor. And instead of building this wall and finishing our cladding, because if you build it in separate components, finishing your cladding flush with the bottom of the wall, you've then got a weak spot because water can come down and it could track in underneath here. So all you do to get over that is you run your cladding longer and now we've sat that down and it's lapping over the floor deck, over some of this sill plate and more, most importantly, it's still not going all the way to the floor. So it's not touching the floor. I'm gonna wick up moisture. Now, why is that important? Well, if you get it right on a shed, you're gonna get it right on a summer house. If you're gonna get it right on a summer house, you might build something bigger. And like this cabin, for example, all I've done is just done a garden shed in 100 square meters and made it into a house. So it's the same thing. You build a shed and it's just a shed. In reality, a house is just a shed, isn't it? A timber frame house at least. It's the heavy side now. Let's face it, it's not the lightest thing to lug around, but the other option would have been to build it in situ. And there's nothing wrong with that if it's never going to move. And to do that, you could build a framework up and then you could go around and clad it and clad it and clad it. A bit more like how we did the cabin. The only thing is, if you're working alone, sometimes it's nice to work on a component at a time. You could lay this down in your garage floor or in the garden or the patio or whatever, build it next weekend, build another half. And you know then that if you ever need to move it, it's easy enough to do. And we've, this is the fourth place. Actually, I've taken it, moved it twice at the last house. So this is the fifth time it's been put up. In this situation, it's not like a stud wall where we're gonna be putting plasterboard on the inside. But the way that these butt together, another thing I've had to do is make sure that when I put this cladding on, I allowed for the wall that's going this way to sit into there. Got my sides all wrong. The tall one's meant to be that side. So that's that side. That one's this end because it's sloping that way.
You only need to pick up a shed, a flat pack shed, and you'll realize how lightweight they are. More than likely, what you're gonna get wrong if you build something for yourself is you'll over-engineer it. Everything's like designed to be as lightweight and as cheap as possible in the shops, but actually when you build it for yourself, it might cost you 10% more, maybe even only 5% more to go one size of timber up. You know, if this was a bigger shed, you might want these to be 75 mil or even 100 mil. Uh, if it, you know, if it was a workshop size, but in reality, you're still gonna end up building this to a standard that's probably heavier duty than anything you'll find on the shelf. Cladding is quite often only eight mil or so on the flat pack sheds. You know, this is 12. I mean, lighter wouldn't be a bad thing sometimes. Another tip if you're working alone, which is quite common in DIY, you don't underestimate how useful clamps can be because you can clamp everything. It's like having a second person with you and you can't really argue with them. They can't talk back. So I'll leave this a little bit loose so we can just get everything tight before I fix it down to the bottom. Same over this side. I did this window when I first built this. Never glazed it, mainly because one of the key things in a shed is a bit of ventilation. You find that quite often the underside of a roof, you get a bit of condensation forming on the wood. Things can get damp and a bit moldy. So the more airflow, the better. Don't try and seal it all in. I just thought another lesson you'll learn on a shed. Now, if you buy a gate or a braced door with a, a legend braced door, you'll notice you get these angles, these braces that stop it from racking side to side. In this shed, we haven't put any, there's such small walls. We haven't put any diagonals, but if we did want to try and push the shed that way, it might actually rack. And that's kind of when it goes off square. Uh, so you could put the diagonals in here, but with the door, typically you would do it uh, on the door to stop the door from sagging over time. And this door, the hinges are this side. These angles should be going up. In reality, they're just carrying some of the fixings for this cladding and the door's never budged. But there's another lesson that you can learn, which is always raise up from the hinges on a wooden door. Different if it's a steel door and you're welding a frame but you want these to be going up the other way. I'm not gonna correct it, because it hasn't moved in however long it's been. Sorry, I'm just putting a shed up. Yeah, I will, that's fine. Okay, bye bye. There's also nothing more satisfying than building something in pieces and it all slot together. It doesn't always happen first time, but again, try it out on a shed before you build a house. And don't leave your drill too far away from Oh, door's locked. Unbelievable. I remember what I did, I screwed it shut. Screw snapped. You'll also get to learn that if it doesn't move, get a bigger hammer. If you build it yourself, you're gonna learn things. You're not gonna get to the end of that and look back on it and think, I wish I'd never built the shed. You're probably gonna have wished you'd done something differently. And that's the same with every single project I've ever done. And probably you as well. If you build something, you, you think in your mind, oh, that would have been better if. And that's how all these incremental sort of improvements make a difference. And remember, you can make improvements on a running project. You know, things can be tweaked and changed, but it's all better, always better if you can get as close as you can in the planning stages. So don't overthink that bit. Now, before you ask, no, I don't have plans for a shed and I don't intend to make any plans, but you get the idea. If you can do this, you can do lots of things. I would say start with a shed, start with a log store, start with a bin saw, anything like that. And then the next 
bit you'll just feel a little bit more confident to make a stud wall or a feature wall in your house or maybe even make a little home office in the garden. If you do a shed and then maybe move on to a home office, as soon as you get into the home office territory or the garage conversion territory, you are almost ticking off 80% of the things you're gonna to need to do an extension or even a house build because at that point, you might have building regulations involved or at least you'll have a, an understanding of what is required to make a building work, whether that's insulation, glazing, wiring, all those components and the regulations behind them. You'll also get an understanding of how you will use sheet materials because there's no good in putting in uh, your timbers wherever you want them. It might work with a cladded building like this, but in a an outbuilding where you're gonna put a sheet material on the inside like plywood or plasterboard, you'll soon realize you can't do that. You need to make sure you plan ahead so that all these timbers end on a join of the board. Same with the insulation, you'll start looking into it and it's just mind boggling how many opinions and methods of insulating a building there are. But there's one golden rule which is lots of it because you don't want to overheat in the summer certainly not in an office building in in your garden they get hot quick but equally there's no point in heating when you don't have to so insulate 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 we are now into late october and i know it's been mild but even with this very modest amount of insulation that's gone into this cabin we remember we only use 100 mil stud work so that's kind of four inch stud work and on the outside of that, we put wood fiber board as well, but there's no great amount of either wool insulation or big slab of PIR in there. It's just detailed well, and also it's draft proof, air proof, uh, airtight as well. And those things have got to us to a point where we haven't heated that at all since we moved in. And the minimal amount of heaters and radiators we put in there will easily be enough, touch wood, that we, see it through winter without you know much of a bill at all as far as heating goes and that goes for overheating as well because one of the most common things that people overlook and it's actually part of the regulations now don't know what part h i'm guessing because it's no o maybe for overheating i don't know uh overheating in this country is becoming more and more common the people are getting more into putting big areas of glazing in big sun roofs and uh, roof lights sorry and uh, orangery roofs and lanterns and all that sort of thing and they need to hit that high um, level of insulation that when it comes to summer there's no uh, there's a lack of shading being put into it into the design and this air you know we've got more airtight houses that, that this heat has nowhere to go so more and more you hear people about complaining about overheating and it's quite a serious thing you hear about people getting too hot and actually you know suffering uh health wise in the summer so that's something we're taking into the house design overheating but we've definitely moved away from shed so let's bring it back on topic a shed also gives you a chance to think about your cladding material and the wood finish now this i, I must find out what it was because i even photographed the tin uh it would have been 2010 2011 when i made this so it's actually only 12, 13 years old. But I only put one coat on, because I built this in a weekend when Joe was away, one coat on, and it is held up better than most, uh, and this isn't a really fancy product. It might have been a Ron Seal or a Cooper, you know, it was a, more of a shed varnish type product, but I'm really impressed. And if I can find out what it was, uh, what it was, then I will share it on here because, you know, I've been through my fair share of wood finishes now, and I've made one, uh, some of what well, one conclusion from all of that and that is just don't bother do not bother trying to put any wood finish on any external timber ever bit of a blanket statement but if you're thinking about cladding a building and then you know this is just being freshly cladded yes that's only treated timber but you might like the look of it it's just you know that nice uh new wood look and then down here we've got the cedar larch you know, it's all that nice pinky hues, golden hues. If that was planed, it would look lovely. What do people do? They think, oh, I really want that color to be there forever. And they try and put UV oils on it. Oils, preservatives, anything they can throw at it, often with big price tags. And then what happens is 
soon enough, a year or two later, bits start to peel, bits start to fade. UV is one of the, well, it's just insanely powerful and there is nothing that will last through, whether it's paint finishes, um, whether it's plastics, metals, everything gets affected by UV. So what happens is areas below soffits, fascias, get less uh, exposure to the elements. Those bits stay lovely and golden. Then you have the bulk of it, which will silver and gray, but in patches because you've put a treatment on, so it's not gonna age you know, uh, evenly. And then maybe below windows and where there's drips and, and kind of water flow dripping off, you'll get a different color staining down there. You might have some fixings as well. They might discolor it a little bit. So the golden rule, my golden rule is just give up. Just embrace the fact that you've used wood and it will naturally age over time. You've either used treated wood or a resilient, durable softwood uh, like this, which is cedar. And um, we've got larch as well I've used on here and Douglas fir. And yes, some of those haven't matched up perfectly right now, but you know, give it a year, all of this will just mellow down. And even the treated timber on this side will soon enough end up being the same color as this softwood. Now, of course, if it was just plain pine, white wood or whatever, it, it's not gonna last without something. So you might need to paint it. If I wanted to, I could paint this, that's different. I'm not talking about uh, painting not being an option because you know if you want it to be a different color, it's worth doing. And in the past, I've thought about staining or painting this, but that's different from trying to preserve the color. I think you're just fighting a losing battle if you're trying to keep wood to be a certain color. Same with oak. You know, oak will, I, I, I've used different finishes on oak frames, on oak, if, if it's just around windows, bit of joinery, yes, you might be able to manage, you know, in every three or four years, put, a, you know, rub it back, give it a coat. But if it's big oak frames or gazebo or pergola or something like that, just let nature take its course. It will still last. Airflow's the key. You're not gonna stop something from weathering by putting oil over it. Um, really, it's all about air. And um, there's examples around this farm where there's timber that's either just normal treated softwood on the barn there, which is uh, 50 years old, absolutely solid. You could just run it through a planer and you'd never know it was 50 years old. It's just great. Just standard softwood that is. And then the older barns, timbers in there, which are three, 400 years old. Again, rock solid, a little bit of woodworm, but actually no rot because it's all about airflow. All of these buildings, the air flows through them and that's what's keeps it keeping it dry and making it last same thing with cladding make sure you've got that ventilation behind anything and it's all good it's all good it'll last nature's good to you i'm sorry it, it was a rabbit hole topic i don't know um so we've got our shed this is my little um my little hack i don't know if i've ever had the key for this padlock um but you know a padlock looks like a deterrent from a distance so uh <laughs> for the last 10 years I've just had one screw on there, you know, looks locked. In reality, I think it's only gonna have recycling and a few tools, hand tools, garden tools in it. Right, she needs a bit of love. She needs a bit of rain, but tomorrow I'll get the roof on. Right, I knew I should have pushed on and got this done yesterday whilst the, uh, the clear skies were there, but uh, we're gonna get this roof on. I've started moving it down. And it made me think that another thing you can learn when you're building something like a shed is how to move materials because it might be the first time you have materials delivered. It might be the first time we've had to deal with full size sheet material, whether that's plywood or OSB or something like that. And there's various different ways and methods you can use to move stuff. And also learn the golden rule, which is try not to move stuff more than you need to. Try and get it either delivered, whoever's delivering it, to exactly where it needs to be, or think three steps ahead if you're moving stuff around so you don't have to constantly be moving piles and piles of timber and materials. So anyway, we're, we've got it down. I've managed on a sack truck. Another good way is to run a rope from one corner to the other and create itself a handle. Uh, or you can get little contraptions which hook under. But there's lots of ways that you can carry big materials without any heavy machinery. But there's always an element of elbow grease required.
Well, that was quite a satisfying slot. Good to know it still fits. So this roofing felt is probably on its last legs and I believe I've got a piece of EPDM left from the oak porch build, some of you might remember, and I think it should fit this. So maybe if you're interested, I'll do a shed roof upgrade video in the near future. And to do that, I'll probably lift the roof off, do it on the floor and lift it up just because of access, but equally you could do it in, in, in place anyway. Well, there we go. We've got our nice little dark and dingy shed. I'm sure we can put a solar light in if we really want to. What I might do, you probably can't tell because it's only the GoPro, but you can see some of this gray black sort of spotting on here. That is uh, like a bit like a black mold, but it's not got to that stage. Obviously it doesn't help that we left the roof off overnight in the rain, but this is all to do with ventilation. This is pretty much weatherproof. There's no way, we've got a bit of light, but plenty of ventilation. So I'm happy with that. I think I might just put a couple of holes uh, either side up there just to get a bit of ventilation across to make sure things stay dry, especially if it's gonna have bites and things. It doesn't take long for things to rust. Yeah, definitely on its last legs. Now, a few more things that are worth talking about on a project like this. We're talking beginner level, but actually whatever stage you're at, you're just looking for the next rung up the DIY ladder. It might be right at the bottom and you might be doing a log store or a bin store or whatever, uh, or it might be something a bit more elaborate. However, building materials come in, typically building materials come in specific sizes, whether that's 1.8 meters or 2.4 meters, 3.6, 4.8. You'll notice that timber comes in particular lengths. Sheet materials come in particular sizes. Don't be uh, mistaken by the imperial versus metric. You might design all this really nicely uh, in SketchUp or on a piece of paper or whatever, and then realize that uh, you've picked up a load of eight by four sheets rather than 2.4 by 1.2 meter sheets. So just be careful about that. It's one little slip up that I've made over the years. But this shed, I built to be exactly eight by four feet, or maybe actually it was 2.4 by 1.2. It was such a long time ago. And the reason for that was because originally I was gonna use sheet material for the roof and for the floor. And that just meant less cutting, uh, easier way of making sure that I didn't have excess uh, scrap left over. So for instance, these were bought as 2.4 meter lengths. So I knew that they were gonna be very close to what I needed. And the same along here, because it's 1.2, I know that you know I can just cut them in half and that would give me my cladding along the back there. Also, just for a little bit of a hardware feedback, these are just hand nailed, little ring shank nails, uh, galvanized ring shank nails, and they've held up really well. I would suggest that if I'd used screws, it probably would have been less tidy and also might not have held up as well. Um, so don't be afraid to just get a hammer out. You know, it's the most inexpensive way to build something, hammer and nails, yet that is how buildings have been held together for centuries and there is just nothing wrong with it. So don't think that that is an antiquated way of going. In actual fact, I use nails more now than I did five years ago. Now, while this video might have just been me putting together uh, an old shed that I built, it's a little bit more than that because it also leads into our next project. And I want to get a bit of uh, feedback from you guys what you want to see. Now, as part of our house build, which we can't start yet because, you know, the people, the powers that be and the planning uh, saga continues. But what we can start are some of the isolated freestanding buildings that are required as part of our planning permission. So while the main house will be over there, out here, we need to provide a bin store and a bicycle store. And they're two quite frequent sort of requirements for uh, a new build or a dwelling or a barn conversion. You have to provide those things because everyone needs to use their bicycle more and you need to keep your waist somewhere tidy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build those bits standalone projects and they can either sit in the barn or we can start using them out here and I can just forklift them into place or telehandler or whatever it might be. But the most important thing for you guys is we're gonna do some oak framing. I'm gonna make them up. I've got some oak cladding already, but I'm gonna source a local sawmill near me, I hope, and we're gonna get some oak milled up. I'll probably do it in five by five sort of size, so it's gonna be quite chunky. Uh, they're not gonna be huge structures, but you know, we like chunky and I can get some decent joinery in there. 
Uh, we're gonna do that as a standalone project and there might be one, there might be two. Uh, and if you wanna see a, an approach to that in a particular way, that's what we wanna know. Do you wanna see just a start to finish, all guns blazing, all the tools out and just get it built, one big uh, kind of hero video? Or do you want me to break it down and explain to you how I'm gonna design it in the first place? How I'm gonna kind of prep all the wood, a bit like I did on the workshop build and do you know an episode on getting all the tenons done and the mortises done and get back into that timber framing theme. Um, so let me know, really interested to hear what you think. But really, like I said, there are, there are a few key elements to DIY, one of which is the kind of knowledge and resources, but really it's all about confidence. And if you gain your own confidence by building something small, it's just incremental. No one kind of woke up one morning and decided they were gonna build a, a four bedroom house, you know, and set to it that morning. You, you build your confidence, you build your skill set, and hopefully together with other creators on YouTube, people sharing their projects uh, on other social media, you kind of get a feel for what can be done. You know, we're just all learning in the same way as everyone else. And incrementally, you will make your way through the projects. And before long, you'll be building something you never even dreamt of even attempting. For now, it's back to the kind of never ending task of keeping this place tidy, get stuff away. The rain seems to have died down now. The floods have receded and the sheep are not swimming. This is not just a shed. This is the first ever shed. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Whoa, it's a I think I have banged on enough about the, the rites of passage of DIY, but it's all about confidence. Get out there, buy yourself some tools, find some tools. You know, people are giving away stuff all the time. Hand tools, people don't want, uh, you know, grandparents workshops that people just need some help by relocating these tools to someone that's gonna use them and love them and cherish them. They don't need to be fancy. They don't need to be the latest technology. It's all about just having something that you can use. And maybe if we do start this timber framing project and I've got those two structures to build, maybe, dare I say it, maybe one of them I'll do hand tools only, but we'll see. Right, I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you for watching. Remember, if you can, do it yourself and we'll see you next time.